let me welcome you know, present the uh, uh, name of the uh, Taiwan Institute of Economic Research uh, and his colleagues, uh, including uh, uh, Dr. Tan Ching Yu, Director of the Multi Market Development Study Center, uh, Dr. Chen Huashang, Director of Cross State Development Study Center, uh, Steffi Tung, and the other colleagues present here. Professor Lin, we are truly you know, honored that um, we could find time to come to the okay. Institute. I understand it's your first visit to India. You have been here for uh, four days. Only four days. Yeah. He, has been, uh, he's, he has come to India just to understand what's happening in India in context of uh, President Tsai ing uh, New South Bond policy. We were just discussing that uh, this is uh, a moment of uh, strategic opportunity in engagement between uh, India and Taiwan. I don't say that lightly. There are, in fact, circumstances, conjunction circumstances, which provide uh, special openings. And uh, we have people like Ambassador Lothana is having our office in, the, in uh, Taipei earlier. Mm -hmm. We have uh, worked tirelessly for years to see that uh, engagement with India and Taiwan is expanded. Things have come a long way. I have also been involved with this exercise since 1993, so for some time. Uh, but we believe that today we can bring about a uh, quantum jump engagement between India and Taiwan. And we were very encouraged by comments, you know, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen made uh, uh, when she met with journalists from India and five other countries on the uh, fifth day, uh, 2017. One could see that uh, for her, India is a special account, and this is not just uh, a routine, you know, uh, relationship, but something which means uh, a lot to her and to her administration. Today, you know, President Lin will uh, talk about the. Uh, Taiwan-China economic and trade relations. Uh, we will look at the state economy, both in Taiwan and in mainland China. Uh, how China remains uh, by far the number one uh, trade and investment partner of Taiwan. Uh, what are the issues in uh, cross-state relations, the economic domain? What are the prospects? We uh, will talk about those things, uh, including what uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative means for uh, Taiwan. But I've also requested that, you know, deviating from the advertised uh, topic of discussion today, we should talk about uh, New South Bond policy of Taiwan also, and how we can utilize it to expand uh, uh, engagement with India and Taiwan. So welcome once again, uh, President Lin. We are looking forward to your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay. It's my honor to deliver a speech here, and uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about the cost-trade economic and the trade relationships. I organize my outline as this, the uh, introduction, then I will talk about the cost-trade economic cooperation, then about the uh, latest development, and also uh, if I have time, I will introduce Taiwan's economic situation and the outlook, and finally as a new uh, Taiwan economic policies. But if I don't have enough time, maybe I will start, uh, start there, because uh, many we are to going to focus on the cost-trade relationship today. That's what I was told at the first time. OK, the first is the, the map. I always teach students, you need to understand the geography. Otherwise, you cannot understand the relationship. Yeah. So actually, Taiwan and India is not that far, but before we have only little relationship. That's maybe because Satil uh, from Taipei to Delhi is a kind of uh, six or seven hour flight, and uh, two and a half time difference. But actually, two and a half is not bad. When we travel to Europe or to to United States, it's upside down. So I feel it's quite hard, but today it's comfortable. Yeah, so quite good. 
But so, uh, about the four days in Delhi, I already find a huge opportunity to have the cooperation uh, between Taiwan and the India. So the map can help us to do the business here in the future. We have the red flag, so that's easy. Uh, the introduction, I also want to contribute to this institute because you are focusing on China. China now is the largest trader in the whole world. The largest owner of the foreign exchange reserves. The second largest economy and the third largest recipients of FDI. For FDI, that's important because of the new technology and also the new investment. Here, right now, China contribute to the world economy, just like the United States. It's around 38, 36%. But for UK, Japan, you can see it's quite small already, become less than 10. This is the graph about the reserve. Uh, when in 2015, the reserve the, of China reached the highest, it's almost 4 trillion. But for the last two years, the reserve down to 3 billion, 3 trillion. That means just between two years, the reserve dropped a lot, 1 trillion. Of course, it do come up a little up now because of the, also the better uh, trade environment or better economic growth. But for those two years, you can see the reserve dropped a lot. The capital right, and also uh, people think uh, maybe they, their money in the mainland China is not belong to themselves because the money in China belong to the communist. Communist only the money come out that they, they can claim that's their own property. So that's the reason the, the reserve to lose a lot. Of course, China wants, also want to invest. Uh, in the other country, from their uh, government-owned uh, investment company. But I think this is a kind of signal for China. They should be cautious about the losing of their uh, foreign reserve. Okay, for China now, they have the 13th of the five-year plan. Uh, in Taiwan, we also have this kind of uh, planted economy before. But right now, Taiwan become uh, kind of uh, the, the we don't make such big plan because Taiwan is kind of free free economy. But for China, still they are the uh, government planted economy. So uh, then this is the thirties five year plan. Mainly they are focusing on how to transform their industry, how to upgrade their industry, especially for the environment, uh, the green energy, and uh, also how to open up their their, their market um, to face the, uh, the war or to be free in the business, <coughs> and uh, how to reform their state-owned enterprise because their their enterprise are state-owned and uh, quite big. For Taiwan, I think we have the small, medium-sized enterprise. And this experience may be better for uh, India. But stay on uh, is kind of traditional for China. So this is the 13th five-year plan. Right now, China faces a problem because they have extra capacity and uh, their production is polluted. So besides the five-year plan, they also have the reform on the supply form or supply side about the uh, labor, the land, and the capital, and uh, you know, how to make the innovation, uh, the new enterprise. Before we call the uh, demand side, is on investment, consumption, trade, and the monetary policy. But uh, as you may know, after the financial tsunami in 2008, uh, the monetary policy become useless. That's because of the uh, QE and also the very low interest rate, almost reached zero. So 
demand side right now seems is helpless for the to stimulating the economy. So uh, China turned to the supply side. They want to have better or uh, more labor. So before they has only one child policy, but they opened the door for people to have the second baby. And they want uh, their land reform. Uh, the land belongs to the government. But right now, they want to the land to, uh, to open up. And the capital, uh, the state-owned capital, uh, release and become the free society, to the free society. And also, the innovation is important. In China, we criticize China they, because they don't have much freedom. So the innovation is bad. I think only in the democratic country, people can have more freedom and uh, can have more innovation. So uh, China also want to, to uh, deny their demonstration and also have more ventures. So this is called the supply fund reform. In China, now, another big problem is the corruption. So, Xi Jinping now faces the big problem when he become the, uh, uh, the chairman. So, uh, he has the anti-corruption campaign since 2013. This year, as you may know, the 19th uh, National Convention for their party it's a big decision who will be the successor. And uh, uh, his policy is secure. I mean, people pick up his policy. People think anti corruption is good. But actually, this is a kind of power struggle or group struggle. The anti corruption are ended to different groups. Of course, maybe few on his group, but the other side of the group, maybe from Jiang Zemin, those, those people uh, are the main target for the anti-corruption campaign. So uh, people, Hans Tigers, and also uh, Swiss Christ. And so many high rank officers or governors already stepped up because of the anti-corruption. In China now, for the economic reform, the other important one is free trade zone. Because for the free trade zone, they can have the uh, better freedom, free trade, free entry of the personnel, free currency circulation, and the free storage for the community, and the free usage of the uh, free entry of the community. Many of these are also important for the internalization of the, the main people because it's capital control. But in the free trade zone, capital can flow in and flow out. And also, free trade zone is important because of um, in the free trade zone, the administration becomes less and less. They even call the negative list. That means everything is possible if it is not in the list. Before everything, you have to report and uh, get a permission. But in the negative list, you don't need the, the, the permission. <clears throat> you can do whatever if it is done in the list. So called the negative list policy. And uh, for the free trade zones, it started in 2013, uh, September in Shanghai. And then uh, in 2015, to Tianjin, Fujian, and uh, Guangdong, uh, those, those three areas. And then last year, also the seven new free trade zones uh, from different places, like in uh, Liaoning, uh, Zhejiang, uh, Henan, he Hebei, Sichuan, Chongqing, etc. Because those new seven free trade zones are for the one bear one dog. Of course, they have different uh, missions. So in this uh, picture, uh, they describe what's opening or the main target for their uh, free trade zone. Uh, I will leave my that my PowerPoint uh, here. So if you don't need to write down everything or you, you cannot see, you can trace, trace it later. 
okay, for China, right now they want to do the uh, industrial transformation. This one is uh, the main target is for the main in China 2025, and also the other one is called Internet Plus. What is made in China 2025? That's specified 10 areas like IT, uh, aerospace, ocean energy, uh, transportation, and uh, uh, new energy, robots, material, electronic equipment, bio and uh, pharmaceutical, and also medical equipment. And uh, for the internet plus, that they want any internet to to uh, apply to different area. For example, like in the manufacture or in the uh, uh, smart and the green uh, manufacturing, whatever, everything to comply with the internet and I call it the internet plus. Another important one for China now is the uh, RMB internationalization. Uh, <coughs> This has been done by including it in, in, in the uh, SDR. SDR is kind of supplement money in IMF. Right now, the RMB uh, was included starting uh, 2000 and uh, uh, that, that year. And uh, the percentage now is 10.9%. Uh, it's, it's even bigger than uh, great British pound and also Japanese yen. How to make the NMB internationalization? Actually, there are uh, one, two, three, four, five, five ways, just like the, the symbol here. Uh, and that's for NMB as the trade settlement currency, uh, exchange between NMB and other countries, and also developing the NMB bond market. Also, the uh, NMB as the regional reserve currency. And the, the final one and the most important one is very hard to reach is the let me be as the free chain. Because they are capital control. So once they reach this free exchange, the, the capital cannot be controlled. So this will be the hardest one. Talking about the one bear one low, uh, actually there are two two ways. One is from the, the land and the one is from the side. And uh, I found out actually uh, India is all in the uh, uh, commercial uh, geography area. So for, for the one bear one low, they, they want to do their policy coordination for, and there are five, five, at least five. Okay, now, let, let me see. Policy coordination, uh, fake con connectivity, connect, uh, connect, fake policy connectivity, and uh, facility connectivity. And and this about trade. Yeah, this is about trade and also about the financial integration and the people bond to people. Bond to people. Okay, people bond to people. So that's their main uh, target. People talk about the uh, one bill one law as the Marshall Plan. But when I talk to uh, people in mainland China, they always say it's not, not as simple as the original Marshall Plan. Because Marshall Plan is uh, after World War II, and uh, that helped the European nations. But for Marshall Plan now, they also want feedback. Feedback is, is important. Mm -hmm for the one bill one law for, for China. So they think this is two way, not just one way as before. And there are several uh, Im important projects to do the investment, uh, like high speed rail, transportation, tourism, infrastructure, uh, construction, uh, machinery, uh, nuclear power plant, and also steel and the segments. Why we identify those areas? Because, as I just mentioned, China has extra capacity. This is so serious. China produced too much after uh, 30 years uh, open up door. So, in the steel, for example, like in the steel uh, industry, 
iron steel price dropped a lot. So even in the uh, Western countries, the steel company, they cannot maintain their price because of huge competition. competition. That's the, uh, that's make them hard to operate. So China want to export their extra capacity to the one bill one door to help them to release the tension. But to do the infrastructure construction need money. So China find a way to help or to do the financial uh, plan that called AIIB, the Asia uh, Infrastructure Investment Bank. For the, this bank, it's not like IMF or World Bank. Because as, <coughs> as we may know, World Bank, the main target for World Bank is to help the poor people. The target for IMF is to maintain the international financial order. But for AIB, it's a kind of business that can finance the infrastructure construction. So actually, this one do have a return. That's also the reason why when United States won't or ask uh, British or Germany or uh, France, they don't, they should not join AIB. But finally, those European countries still join AIB because it's a kind of business. They can also earn the money. This year, in May, has a summit in Beijing. At that time, even uh, United States sent a delegation to join the meeting. That means right now, even the United States think AI, the one bear one law is kind of uh, important. They need to watch it. Watch it. And we can also already see, actually, there are several initial investment projects in AIB. For example, like in uh, Pakistan, uh, Uzbekistan, Pakistan, or Bangladesh, Indonesia. They already did the money from the AIB. Okay, so that's my long introduction about China. I hope this can contribute, contribute what we uh, have uh, and, uh, to this uh, ICS. Now turn to the, the uh, my second uh, second topic about the uh, constraint economic cooperation. We have the cooperation with China. The net is not FTA, but the ECFA. The Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement. Why we cannot call FTA? Because FTA is a kind of international usage among countries. But right now, cross trade, both sides of the government think it's hard to say we are a kind of country to country issue. Because right now, the cost trade is still a kind of in the uh, uh, civil war. We never signed peace treatment. So, although we have the uh, uh, all the freight traffic uh, among cross trade, but not any single airplane from the other country. Because we said, you're saying cost trade is a kind of internal issue. So we have a different name as FTA. So we call it cost uh, economic cooperation framework agreement. And then you can see this is a, the original uh, purpose is only focused on economic cooperation. Did not without inter involving political issues. And then the official ECFA includes the preamble, five chapters, and the sixteen uh, articles, and also uh, the supplements. Mm -hmm. For ECFA, 
that's the beginning of constraint communication. That means before, actually, only very few constraint communication. But in the past, in the 80s, Taiwanese firm already invest in manufacturing industry in mainland China. Why in the manufacturing industry? Because of accessibility, accessibility of and the standardization of the work. That means uh, Taiwanese business people they set up a plant in China and uh, they manufacture goods, they export to European or to United States. Not for China's domestic market, but for export. So it's easier or isolate from the society. It's easier to do the manufacturing. So that's also the reason why uh, in China there are very few Taiwanese financial institutions. Because until we signed ECFA, until 2009, we have the MOU with Chinese government. Then we can start up the financial industry in mainland China. Because financial industry is kind of highly regulated by the government. So we have to sign MOU first, then ECFA. And also, the progress of the ECFA is a kind of the beginning of the communication between service industry. As I just mentioned, uh, manufacturing industry, that's easier to enter the market. But for service industry, it's also highly regulated. So after we sign the ECFA, then that's the, the beginning of the cross trade uh, service exchange. So that's in 2010, we signed the ECFA. Between we signed the ECFA, uh, actually also who signed the ECFA, there are two middlemen. One from Taiwan is called SDF, uh, Trade Exchange Foundation. And the other one is from China, ARATS. Not from the government. Not from the government. We have the five growth, or we call it middlemen. And uh, now we already signed 11, uh, uh, we already have 11 conference, 23 agreements, and uh, also two consensus. So many, everything in economics has already been reached, but none of political issue. So that's also a reason when our new government uh, take power, uh, uh, President Tsai say, we, after eight years of mind just regime, we put too much eggs in mainland China. We should diversify our portfolio. So, uh, President Tsai say we should do the southbound policy. That's the reason why we need the southbound policy. Because after eight years of, of previous regime, we rely too much on uh, China for the economy issue. It's also the problem of, because uh, cross-trade right now, not, there is no political agreement. So we can, we can stop, or, or everything is hard to progress now or in advance because there is no political agreement. But anyway, uh, <coughs> Ma Ying-jeou took power in 2008. To 2008 to 2016, uh, the previous government had done a lot of things uh, on the cost trade issue, including uh, open up the the market for the Chinese travelers, and the, also the students to study in Taiwan, uh, and also several several agreements. Basically, without talking about political issues, everything is here. Okay, so this is the number about uh, the Taiwan and the China's. Uh, economy. Uh, this is the export and the import. As you may see, from 90s, uh, export to mainland China, I mean Taiwanese goods to, to China is 12.2 12 
12%. But right now, it's around 40% already. So Taiwan is important for, uh, China is important for Taiwan's from the market point of view. They, they occupy our 40% export. But for the import, uh, only 20%. Starting from 33% to, to 20%. That produce the surplus for Taiwan. So Taiwan do enjoy the surplus from mainland China. This is from the, the trade in goods. How about the investment? It's even more unbalanced because for Taiwan we already invest of a lot of money. Uh, this is in the mini. So actually. Uh, it's about 150 trillion. It's 143. Right now it's 150 trillion US dollars. We uh, 150 billion we invested in mainland China US dollars. But for mainland China, they only invest. Uh, this is thousand, thousand. So this is the million. This is only 1.6 or 1.7. Billion. <coughs> this is quite unbalanced. 150 versus 1.7. According to the survey from the uh, uh, Import Export Association of Taipei, people said to think men in China rank as the number one of the main destination for import and export trade. And also, uh, the trade block with great development potentials. Uh, trade block with great advantage in integration of value chains. And the trade block with great advantage in domestic trade. Of the other uh, index is set here also quite high, I mean, for many China in people's mind. About the characteristic future of cross trade economic and the trade, actually, we said here think there exists of both complementary and also competitive interactions. But the problem is the cross trade economic and the trade is set here influenced by the politics. For example, right now, actually, the situation between Taiwan and the China become kind of tension. So, um, for those Taiwanese business people, they are in mainland China, kind of uh, feel, I mean, the feeling seems hurt, or it's kind of tension, they, they feel it's uncomfortable. So, influenced by politics, not without, without any uh, considerations. But, we can still say, the economy and the trade determines economic development on both sides. For example, for Taiwan, cost trade is still an important engine for economic growth. On the other hand, for mainland China, cross trade economic facilities the modernization of development of the Chinese economy. So we said the thing. Taiwanese business people can help in China to do their transformation or to do their reform of the uh, supply side. So cross-trade set up mutual demands for technology, innovation, and also upgrading. We have we share this common target or common uh, background for the future. For example, uh, in the 13 five years plan and in Taiwan's Asia Silicon Valley development, we set here uh, need more innovation and uh, more upgrading. Here uh, we identify several uh, sectors, for example, the medical appliances, the robots, also the uh, uh, deep industrial cooperation, 
and also for uh, ICT or the semiconductor area. The important thing is for value chain. How to move up the value chain? So uh, actually, we do hope in the economic view, we should the constraint should have more cooperation to move up the value chain together. So as me, for me, I'm an economist. I do hope the cost trade uh, can hand in hand to help each other to do the economic cooperation. For e economists, we think we can make the pie bigger and uh, divide it, then people can share more. But uh, for the political things, often it will be zero sum game. So that's hard for from the thinking of political issues. One important thing is for 5G stand, standard, because the next generation of the telecommunication is 5G. We do hope the constraint can hand in hand to develop the new standard. Here is I talk about the service industry. Uh, as I mentioned, the service industry only open door because of we sign ECFA. Without ECFA, the service industry cannot move forward. Right now, we already see uh, several uh, Taiwanese uh, brand name, I mean service industry, <coughs> uh, rooted in mainland China. So service industry, actually, we also see that's our expertise and uh, can help China to become a better uh, service society. And we also identify the new industrial cooperation. That means uh, before we only do the manufacture, but right now to have the manufacture and the service together, that's called the uh, 2.5 generation of the service industry. That include uh, wholesale, retail, logistics, and the franchise business. So that's the uh, cooperation for the service industry. And uh, we also think because Taiwan and the China, we have the same language, the same culture. Of course, the, the uh, we use the traditional Chinese, but they, they use the simplified one. But anyway, the culture is, is the same. So the cooperation on culture and the media and the education service can build more uh, constraint integration. And also, we think the cooperation on the finance industry is important. For example, like the loans offered by Taiwanese bank, we have more money, and the money we want to invest can invest in mainland China. You know, the interest rate in mainland China is still very high. Right now, as I just mentioned, after the financial tsunami, the interest rate almost down to zero. But in mainland China, the interest rate is about 3% higher than the, the average among the other rates. So uh, we can have our uh, law to, to uh, Chinese <coughs> merchandise of their in, in China. And we can also help them to support the small and the medium sized enterprise or to start the financial <coughs> directed business or to do uh, mutual recognition of the financial license and the training. And also important thing is the wealth management in mainland China. It's a big market. And help them to promote the internationalization of the WB. And also we also hope Taiwan to have the opportunity to join AIIB and work together for the one bill one law. And that's the thing we think we can do is the uh, offshore financial center. Because in Taiwan, we already have uh, 300 billion RMB. So that's the second largest storage of the RMB outside China. The number one is, of course, Hong Kong. 
Anyway, 300 billion is a big money. So how to operate, how to do the offshore business that can help Taiwan and can help China? Okay, the latest uh, uh, or the new cross-trade de development. Uh, I should give a background about this because in 2013 in Taiwan we have the sunflower movement. The sunflower movement mainly from students. Students start to think too many Chinese shops come to Taiwan. And uh, even after my previous president Ma Ying Zhou start the cost trade relationship on, on economics. Satio, young people cannot get a bonus. Instead, for those bonus are concentrated in few people. So the sun for fruit movement is similar to the umbrella movement in Hong Kong to against China or to against the cost trade cooperation. So that's also the reason why our new president, Tsai Moon Wen, can be elected. Because that's a different party. That's the party of DPP. Ma Ying Zhou, that's the, the, old, the, the other party called KMT. So, right now, actually, the ECFA comes to start because of the sunflower movement. People start to think how to deal with China, how to set up a new view, or how to perform different way to cooperate with China. So right now, the cost trade new development actually is not that formal as before. That's not from the uh, uh, mutual understanding instead. Right now, seems back to the one side. But also right now the cost trade issue can only progress in the private sector, not from the government support. So you can see the new one is continuing the competitiveness is school. School is no disputes, school or university, that's easy. Competition or competition among students or competition between universities, incubation center, and also the summer winter exchange. That to help students feel at home and uh, can recognize each other and also have more common culture emotion. And also yeah, to help the young people to have more employment or to build the entrepreneurship. That's the, about the internship or the training uh, program. Also, the uh, staff incubator. And because China is getting bigger, and uh, they said, you think Taiwan is part of China. So right now, actually, they shown their phenomenons. So they have the patronage <coughs> policy toward Taiwanese business and also have a national treatment. The first edition is happened in the 90s to 2006. The main purpose is to attract the trading investment. But the second one from 2006 to 2015, that's Exchange for more connections. Many that's also for business for investment. But now come to the third issue. More or generalized system of preference inclusion. That that means they put effort on every sector they want to attract Taiwanese people, not just money, not just investment. 
They keep even the national treatment for Taiwanese people. So what, what does this GSP mean? It's the uh, generalized system of okay. preference. Okay. Okay, so that's their effort. They want to to uh, attract people uh, to from Taiwan to recognize China, to call, to recognize the one China policy. But in Taiwan, as I just mentioned, Taiwan is a democracy country. Taiwan, we are divided. I mean, or the opinion for many China is kind of divided. So, even now, we said new thing. The political issue is hard to deal. But also for the investment, for the uh, economic issue, Senior has some problem. For example, now, because of the shrinking of global trade, uh, especially last year, or to do the SME in mainland China, it's hard because of Financial difficult, and also in China they have the over capacity in some industrial sectors. So, still need more help. For example, the national treatment for Taiwanese investment in mainland China, and also the access for different industrial, and also to avoid <coughs> double taxation need only the policy support from uh, the cost-trade governments. These are the suggestions we collect from our business people and think this is important in the near future. The first one is we should promote peaceful and intensive interaction between Taiwan and mainland China without interference of political issues and uh, to help the enterprise from both sides to face the challenge brought by the globalization together. The second one is to create a win-win situation with cooperation over competition and reduce non-financial and also obstacles to cooperation between enterprise with more official communications. The third one is government from both sides should discard all ideology and uh, try to compromise each other's position. Or, I should say, face the real. Taiwan is a kind of independent country. You should recognize Taiwan as a country and uh, to face to face with equal to discussion. But actually, this is hard because we feel uh, in my angel's regime, we say one China different representation or one China to the presentation. But right now, actually, Beijing administration say only one China policy. You cannot say with different representation. So it's hard, even for Chinese government. So uh, first the real is what we want for uh, Beijing government. The fourth, promote successful and a smart industrial transition by cost trade cooperation of R and D, innovation, and the protection of inter intellectual property rights, and even eventually enter the global market together. Because in China, the Taiwanese people think they don't protect intellectual property rights, and also uh, the research and development in mainland China. Actually, it's not that, that good. So we should cooperate together. The fifth, government from both sides should offer the enterprise with more opportunities to connect it to global and cooperate and to coordinate capacity of industries for innovative development. This is mainly for uh, the new or the startup, startup industry. Because innovation now can have the most juicy part. You know, 
that we have done another OEM. But OEM or manufacturer only have little produce, little margin or little profit. The startup, the, the newly development can have the uh, highest part of the profit. And the final one, cost trade economic and the trade cooperation should be a supported cooperation paradigm for the next generation and that lead to the development of the new model of the industrial and the consumption. Many this is for the next generation. As I just mentioned, in Taiwan, the young people, they have some flower movement. So, in many China, they should fix the real. Their, their policy toward China, uh, toward Taiwan, should attract more young people. So that young people has the recognition of China. So we think how to help the next generation is important. So that's the suggestion we collect from our business people and from uh, some intellectuals. So up to here is what I talk about all the uh, close trade relationship. The rest of the, my PowerPoint, that's for Taiwan and also the new uh, economic policy that is something like our, we, our government want to do now. I think it's not related to, to cost trade, so I will stop here. If needed, then uh, any question related to that, I will point to that. Okay? Thank you for your attention. some inhibition, though there is a forward movement in cross-strait relationship. I want to know regarding uh, Taiwanese investment in mainland China's infrastructural areas. Uh, are there any limitations imposed or any uh, you know, parameters there? Okay. Maybe we can jump questions together. I right. <laughs> like to answer the question in which way as you like. Yeah, I think this is a big question. Yeah, sure. So I would like to answer now. Uh, for Taiwanese people, Taiwanese business people invest in mainland China. As I mentioned, manufacture is the most important part. Starting from 1980s. Of course, of course, that's the small and uh, medium enterprise. Because uh, at that time, Taiwan's environment getting harder and harder for the small and uh, medium-sized enterprise. If they are polluted, it's a pollution, or if they are they were intensive, if they uh, cannot have high tech, and they use a lot of space to produce. Then, at that time, they feel it's hard to survive in Taiwan, so they move to many China. So many, that's the first move, or the, the, the most important move of Taiwanese business people to many China. So, of course, for that area, it's not that efficient, because that's small and the medium size, and uh, with pollution, with labor intensive, and uh, with low tech. For those business people, actually, uh, in some area, especially for the coastal area, many China already think you are kind of cannot cannot be the uh, state of the art. So ask them to 
retreat or to move to inner side of the mainland China because of their business is not efficient. But for those people, although they are out of debt, they still earn the money because of the land they have now. So they earn the money. And also for those people, their contribution during the last two or three decades, that's good for China because they bring up a lot of employment and they bring up the new uh, management for Ch Chinese people to handle factory or to handle the production line. So that still has contribution. I feel it's, it's unfair. Right now, uh, they are scattered in mainland China, always ignore this part. They always think Taiwanese business people earn the money without much con contribution. But I think we do help them to have the modern uh, to introduce the, the good management and the, to, to that them have more small SME, small and medium enterprise, to help them to have more un, un, employment. Talking about the uh, uh, construction or the infrastructure, actually Taiwanese business people have very few opportunities. Because many we are doing something related to manufacture or the uh, uh, petrochemical or machinery, not the infrastructure construction. Of course, we have our uh, infrastructure construction team in Taiwan for our uh, highway or for railway, but not in mainland China. We also have those people uh, go to uh, Saudi, Saudi Arabia or to the Middle East, help them to construct their highway, but not to mainland China. Mainland China, they are infrastructure construction mainly by their own people, by their state-owned enterprise, like Zong Team, uh, Central Team. In, I mean those big company in mainland China. So we don't have the opportunity to do that. So related to one bear one road. One bear one road, the first priority is the uh, infrastructure construction. We Taiwanese people think we don't have this opportunity because we don't have those big team to do that. But our Taiwanese people, our Taiwanese business people are kind of flexible and uh, have the uh, flexibility to do the rest, to, to supply the daily use or daily items, to do the small business. So we said, you see, we could have some opportunity, but not those infrastructure uh, opportunity in one bill one door. Yeah, that's what I, I can offer. <coughs> We had several questions, but I have to bring them on one. Um, Dr. Lin, in your presentation, yeah. uh, you spoke about the, that Taiwan should join OBOR. Yeah. I have two questions related to it. Is that the view of TIER or the view of present government, Taiwan itself? <laughs> No, the, pre the view of myself and the economist. <laughs> because economists say how to make the pie bigger. And that's one way to make the, the pie bigger. But for our government, as I mentioned, our new government, especially our president, now is kind of conservative about the cross trade relationship. That's also affected by the some of our movement. So she become conservative. And that's the reason he can be elected because young people support her. So when actually the cross trade become tension and they become stuck. Uh, 
Black Tail. Uh, okay. More oh, questions? You're giving me an opportunity to ask more questions? Okay. <laughs> right. Uh, is there a sort of um, major disagreement uh, now between the present government and the business community, on, and the business community in Taiwan, on how to deal with the mainland? And does it also involve then the student community finds itself at odds with the business community? Yeah, I think for a democracy country, we all face this kind of question. <laughs> Indeed, for business people, they think cross trade is a good opportunity. But for the government now, they think we have to be better be cautious. So right now, the Development start. I think New premier now mm -hmm. because the first premier already feel she can he, he cannot do it and uh, we have the new one. So right now actually there is a huge dispute in Taiwan society. And uh, one important thing is cross trade issue. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, uh, my name is Kambir Bhatnagar and I basically represent uh, Merchant House and we are also into business consultancy um, in mainland China. Now, in your, I must thank you, compliment you for your discourse on the cross uh, straight uh, business uh, between the mainland China and uh, Taiwan. Now, why we are just over here? Now, I also wanted to, if you could uh, shed some light on the opportunities which can exist between Taiwan and India. Okay. Uh, as I say, uh, Taiwan has been very good uh, industry, in, especially in uh, IT and semiconductor. But for whatever reason, more political than any other one, it has not made very great relationship between India and Taiwan. Now maybe uh, this subject was not to be covered because it's a very vast subject in itself. But while we were are over here, we would request you if you could shed some light on this. What could be the possible options? What could be the possible opportunities? And how we could develop it? Maybe not taking much of your time over here and sorry for it. Yes. And maybe towards the end, if you could also brief yeah, point number three, which you did not cover, the political and economic outcome, because that is very important. How the relations between our two countries will go further? Yeah, uh, that's quite and here. I mean, your question is very good. Um, as I mentioned. Taiwan has dispute on um, how we should face China. And after eight years of Manjo's regime, the young people feel they don't have the bonus. And are afraid of China because they are too big. Just like Hong Kong. The umbrella, umbrella movement because the young people are afraid of China. So right now our government do think we should diversify or we should have our portfolio shift from OX in mainland China and uh, to put more on the Southeast Asia and also to India. So that's the reason we are here. We think we should diversify our old investment into the other country and uh, we do find out India has good potential. You have a huge population and uh, you have the environment is friendly and the big market. During these days of visit, and our, we have done a lot of homework. We think, for example, like uh, ICD, there are so many products manufactured can be cooperated together. We, you, you know, in Taiwan, we have a uh, good capacity to produce the ICD products. We are number one notebook manufacturer, and even 
before that's the number one desktop computer even now we don't have our brand name for cellular phone but we do supply a lot of uh, semiconductor or IC for those IC design in the cellular phone so in the future I think ICT cooperation is important and also related to something like uh, display or IC design or, or everything uh, can help uh, India to develop your ICT technology and uh, your students are quite smart we, we, we know you have a good science training so your engineer can can do most of the things and uh, now it's industrial 4.0 so we can move our factory here and uh, you can uh, management and produce for your domestic market or even export to the other country the second one is about uh, logistics because we have a good uh, logistic uh, equipment logistic technology uh, for example like food food how to use the truck to different 7-eleven 7-eleven is a convenience store in Taiwan and how to to circle it how to make the food as fresh as it is and uh, this is for traditional uh, logistics and even for high-tech logistics Taiwan is famous for just in time and also uh, good for zero inventory for the uh, ICD product in Western country because of the logistics in Taiwan can supply to manufacturer in in maybe two two hours two hour from the storage to the uh, production line. So this kind of cooperation uh, in India, I think that's also important in the future. I have heard uh, the Apple from uh, Washington, uh, Seattle, and to to Delhi. It's similar a similar price from uh, Himalaya mountain to Delhi. That means the shipping cost is is almost the same. So how to do the logistics is important, and we can can have more cooperation. And the more I think uh, for the uh, uh, small and the medium sized enterprise, how to let people become the owner or the uh, uh, has more enter entrepreneurship uh, to make the SME grow grow better and better. I think that that's we can help. And also there are several things. Maybe this you can say more. Uh, help me to 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 identify you. That's your job. <laughs> okay. Uh, I have to clarify. If you your question is focused on an industrial. Um, no, see, basically while we are discussing over again, let me be very clear because uh, exporter of Indian businessmen uh, to Taiwan per se uh, is generally very low. You, know, you yes. also have South Korea, you also have Japan over there, and that's next to you know, Taiwan. But we do have very strong linkages with these two countries. And we also have a strong very business, very strong business now with China. Yes. But uh, maybe it has got something to do with the political dispensation between China and uh, Taiwan. But may, uh, you know, what I know is that uh, you are very strong in, uh, I, uh, in uh, electronic chips business. But we don't find it over here. Maybe we could, you know, if you could, I, my only thing is I don't want to digress from the main yeah. subject. But if you could uh, shed some light on how do we take it further. Because that would be more of interest to the business than over here. Okay. Uh, I think the basic question is um, that India... Overall. overall yeah. uh, yes. Uh, yes. Um, because in, uh, I think the, uh, India and Taiwan's biggest understanding of each other is still very limited. Uh, I have some example. When we talk about India and Taiwan, everybody, everyone will say, oh, we have two uh, very famous movies from India. That is uh, the, the three idioms, the, which uh, we know that uh, India has many uh, master in science and math, technology. That is the first one. And second one is for this year or maybe last year, later year. The, 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 the micro boxing. Yeah, Dangla. Yeah, Dangla. 
So that is the, yeah, we have very limited understanding um, to what India culture and the, the society. And for how to improve this way is, uh, I think it is to boost tourism and education, to boost the people-to-people -people communication. Then if we have higher understanding, then the businessmen will know how to uh, collaborate or how to plan their business plan here in India and how to trade with Indian people because we are we have limited understanding of the culture and so the limited understanding of the law the uh, the taxi the the tax system or the accounting system financial system so the businessmen are, this is very hard to uh, join this the uh, business and this is the uh, intern, uh, uh, industry point of view. And also, I, I have noticed that, that uh, some India friends have aroused me some um, opportunity to go co operation in the international, um, maybe some, um, if we have some opportunity to, to cooperate in international, maybe foreign or, or some aspects. That um, some of the India friends mentioned that India has joined our set talk, upset negotiation, which is the, uh, a closer closer relation with the ASEAN. Also, Taiwan is promoting new South Bank policy, which is also aimed to uh, ASEAN country and also to the South uh, Southern Asia, uh, Asia country. So. Um, I was thinking about if we have any opportunity to cooperate in the international level that uh, we can do something in international affairs development. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Censorship. 
they don't have freedom of the speech. And uh, as I mentioned, even Chinese people, they are in mainland China, feel if their money is in mainland China, it belongs to the communism. Only the money come out mainland China, they can own the money. So before we do have this kind of education scene, Taiwan has better system. And uh, of course, we do want China to become democracy country. Or they should change their system similar to us. Then we can talk about the United United or United Nations. But the problem is now China become bigger and bigger. And the people right now in Taiwan, we think if we want to seek independence, then it's against their policy. They already announced it. Once we we say we want we are independent, they will use the 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 military to conquer Taiwan. So if we include this thinking, then we will think we had better maintain the status quo. That's the the reason I think in Manjo's regime, he think uh talk to who that means no united, no independence and no war. And the status quo is the most important one. But the problem is China has been getting bigger and bigger. So how to maintain the cost trade relationship is really a very hard way, hard issue. I don't know how to do it. You answered the question. Right? <laughs> Can we move on to next year? Please. Please. Yeah. Uh, you did an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, but mainly focus on the trade and investment and business like that. Yeah. So I would just like to know from you what is the you know exchange of students from the Taiwan to China or vice versa. Yeah. So that is one point, factual point. And secondly, just a response to uh, one who has just yeah. spoken. You know how to increase the awareness of India in Taiwan. I think the best policy would be to send the Taiwanese students to Indian universities yeah. for studies, maybe for engineering or medical or other studies, so that there is a purpose of people who know about India and they get, take back the message about India back to Taiwan. And it will create some kind of awareness about India. So, 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 so India should also send their students to the Taiwan, Taiwan, so that we also know about Taiwan. As you are, you know, largely unaware about India, so are Indians largely unaware about Taiwan. Yeah. So it's a both way this situation is same. Yeah. So the only way to break this ice, in my opinion, would be to have a student exchange program. That's right. Which will help in removing this ignorance. Yeah. So that is what That's I right. have to say. The first one, please, you can yeah. answer. Uh, talking about the uh, student exchange between Taiwan and uh, mainland China, it, it is a successful uh, experience. I think for young people, you know, in their 20s, they even don't know who is Chiang Kai-she, who is Mao Zedong now. So, no history uh, experience on, their, on themselves. That means, right now they are brand new. So that student exchange, and they started together, they share the same experience, then uh, in the future, maybe whatever it comes to Taiwan be independent or be united together, there is no regret. So student exchange is indeed a very important way. But right now, even in the about the student exchange, still has some problems. For example, uh, we don't allow Chinese students to find a job in Taiwan. And then we don't offer them scholarship. They have to pay on their own. So it's kind of discrimination. And even we don't allow them to use our health insurance. Because in Taiwan, health insurance is for everybody. But we, we think they are foreign. <laughs> so they don't, but we are good for usual foreigner student. For example, India student or American student come to Taiwan, we do offer them free insurance. 
or only small money or small expense of the insurance, but not for Chinese students. But even though this has been for five years, it's still okay. I mean, for those people who come to Taiwan from mainland China to study, they do want to study in Taiwan, and they don't care about the insurance fee. It's higher. So, so, but right now we are changing. Has, has it already changed the policy? Insurance, yeah. yeah. Just, just changed recently yeah. to include that. No, I just want to know how many Taiwanese students are presently studying in China, and accordingly, okay. how many mainline Chinese are studying in the Taiwanese? I see, at least 10,000 10, per year to um, mainland China to study. Yes. No, no. For uh, Taiwanese to, to, to China. China. Okay. And the uh, Chinese student come to Taiwan. Uh, it's even more. In 2016, last year, it's uh, 40,000 foreigner student oh. in Taiwan. And it's 40% come from the mainland China. Okay. But for 2017, to this year, mm. it's only 1,000. Because of Beijing. Uh, between China yeah. Only 1,000. Yes. This year, from China to Thailand. Yeah, so Taiwan. Yeah, Taiwan, yes. So it was about uh, 30,000 last year, 1,000 yeah. this year. But, sir, there is one question over here when we are discussing. See, there are differences, a lot of differences between the mainland China and Taiwan. Yeah. But we find that most of your focus is only on China. You know, 40 percent exports only to China, uh, 150 billion investment in China. Yeah. Uh, and then you say that we are against. Oh, well, he made that point about diversification. Uh, yeah. And also because we share the same language, that's easier for busy people to communicate. Come to India, it's hard for Taiwanese people, Taiwanese business people, because their language is not that good. So if they come here, language is the, the most difficult one. Okay. Can you share your knowledge as to? How many companies and how much capital, Taiwanese capital from China has gone to Southeast Asia? I just want to know the scale of this development. With this. And the second question is that, that the present political situation in cross-state relations, how much has that negatively impacted on the, the economic, relation, economic relations between the two sides? Of course, one is a student exchange program that less and less students are coming and studying in China. And another could be the tour, tour, tourist sector. So can you tell, can you please tell us a little bit more about that in particular in which sectors and how much impact negative impact has been witnessed in last one uh, around two years? Okay, thank you. I think for the uh, because of the tension about cross trade, the most influence sector will be the tourist sector because right now we have uh, vacancy hotel. Vacancy, uh, your answer, the, the, uh, the tourist, tourist vehicle. Tourist vehicle, whatever. So that hurt a lot. And uh, maybe the second is the uh, uh, retail, especially for the duty free re retail. You know, uh, many people come to China, uh, come to Taiwan, they buy a lot of duty free goods. And uh, they also think in Taiwan, you can buy the genuine. Genuine one, uh, the brand name, for example, Elbui or whatever the those in the Western country. But now, the because of few tourists, so the the amount drop a lot. But for for the regular business, like Taiwanese people move, uh, go to Benin China to do their business, this part. Uh, I think it's still similar. I mean, we have the forty percent export to China. The, the amount or the the business is still the same. That can count from the uh, statistics with, of uh, export and the import from both sides. So that one is no, no problem. Turn to the first question about how Taiwanese. Business people from mainland China to invest in uh, Southeast Asia. We don't have this kind of statistics because for those people, they already have their money in mainland China. You know, 
people invest in mainland China, they may be not directly from Taiwan. They make a circle when they go to Virgin Island or whatever, and then invest in mainland China. So right now, if they want to move to Southeast Asia, again, we, we don't have the statistics. But we do have, after the promotion of new South, Southbound policy, we do have some uh, some business, some company move to Southeast Asia. Yeah, but this, again, this is only small, because just the beginning. Our President Tsai Ing-wen uh, took office uh, last May, so only one and a half. So the decision usually made should be longer. So right now, uh, seems this part is also still small. But we should have this, this happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Professor Lin, I have two questions. Um, you mentioned in the course of your Q&A that uh, China is getting bigger and bigger and therefore this is a problem for Taiwan. But during the course of the presentation, you are also advocating closer cooperation with Chinese companies to move up the value chain. Yeah. And if you look at the Chinese system, it's a very predatory system where Chinese local governments, Chinese central government will put pressure on foreign companies to part with technology, uh, to part with IP and so on. So then in that kind of a situation, where China is getting bigger, China is putting pressure, how are Taiwanese companies going to gain by this cooperation? Uh, the second question is again, you talked about standards that you wanted Taiwan and China to cooperate on, say, example, the 5G standards. Yeah. Uh, so again, the same question arises. You have pressure. But the other question I wanted to ask is, what difference does it make that you know, if Taiwan were to cooperate on new standards with, say, Southeast Asian countries or India versus cooperating with China? Why is this insistence on China? Thank you. Yeah, your second question is easier. I mean, if we can have cooperation with India to set up a new standard for 5G or whatever, and it is recognized by the whole world, then that's good. I think that's quite possible because India has a big market. So the market decides everything. So the market has decided the standard. So we do hope we can have the opportunity to cooperate with you to set up the standard. Because right now, the standard always make up by United States or, or uh, European. We do need to set up standard in Asia. Yeah, I think that's what we want. And back to your first question. Uh, of course, it's, it's kind of a conflict between one way to make money because the China market is big, and the second is be cautious because China is a kind of uh, not a democracy country is kind of uh, stay on. So actually, we have this tension in Taiwan for a long time. Uh, when Li Denghui's regime, he said, "Jie mm -hmm. You know, you know this term. Uh, how how to translate? Not to rush. Not to rush and not to hurry. <laughs> that means we should be patient. Yeah. We should be patient because China is big. China's market is big, but you have to be cautious on everything. So be patient is the most important one. But actually, when we think about this history, it's back to 1990-something. Because of this, this policy, be patient, we lose a lot of market in mainland China. Because at that time, if we enter earlier, we can be, uh, have better opportunity. And uh, we can be, uh, let our Taiwanese business become much bigger. But anyway, we cannot predict the future, even now or back to then. So, uh, I think in mainland China, we know. China, Chinese government in very detailed way because we have experience, because we share the same language, we share the same culture, we indeed understand what they want. 
So, I think for business people, they right now they want to find a safe way to business to do business in mainland China. For this part, I think it is okay because mainland China also when they go they become bigger, they also want to be internationalized. They also want to follow the international way or international law. So to find a safe way in between is not a hard for Taiwanese business people. We know how to bribe. We know how to avoid the dangerous thing. So I think for Taiwanese business people, they are perform better than the other business people from the other world or the other countries. So you work in India also? Sir. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. But we can also uh, that Taiwan as a springboard to help the other countries people if they want to invest in many channels. That's what we specialize. Yeah, so, so for Indian people, if you want Chinese market, you can cooperate with Taiwanese uh, company, especially they have already have good or big performance in mainland China. We can have good cooperation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you, you can say more. I have an example to refer you this question. Um, when it comes to the, the, the big enterprise like Foxconn, um, you know, Foxconn just uh, released some uh, investment plan in the uh, United States Wisconsin. And also, in the same time, it, uh, Foxconn just released uh, an huge investment, new investment in China. So for, for this kind of international uh, enterprise, they are uh, they are very good in using the strategic cooperation. And I think this is a, a relation between China, Taiwan, and the US. These kind of international uh, enterprise are very good in the balance of power in, in this situation. And that is not for Taiwanese government credits. This is for private sector story. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, domestic politics there. My question is because I study Chinese politics, but it comes to again asking, I can't stop asking this question to you. Like, what would happen uh, if after the post 19 party Congress, what would, as a scholar, as, a, as an intellectual, how do you see Taiwanese economy, economy after 19 party Congress? And secondly, because as, uh, as Xi Jinping's, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, sorry, 100 anniversaries in 2049, and as well as uh, 19, uh, sorry, 2021, 22. So, how do you see relation of Taiwan vis-a-vis -vis, uh, China? Yeah. Okay. Uh, again, Taiwan is compared to China is small because we have only 23 billion people million people. And the Taiwan's uh, area is only uh, 30,000 squ uh, square kilometers. Taiwan is small compared to China. But Taiwan's population actually among the United Nations, 23 million people is not small. It's about, uh, I counted, about 45 among the whole of all the countries. So in this sense, we cannot uh, look down ourselves. In Taiwan, because we have the freedom of everything, so I think the innovation part in Taiwan should be better. And our, we have better education system 
although we don't have that, that much money, but we have more flexibility. And that student to demonstrate their ability better and to foster their confidence. So I think we have good potential in the education and also in, in to raise the talent people. Let me tell you, we have, have the number three patent rights among the whole world. Many of our patents is from manufacturing. For example, TM, TSMC has huge patent rights. Even FastCom has patent rights. So, talking about the uh, uh, the people, the students, I think Taiwan's university is still good. I mean, Taiwan can raise people, raise talent people better. But talking about the economy, actually, the, as you may know, Taiwan's growth rate is lower now. We have only 2%. Last year, 1.5% growth rate. Many in China, their growth rate is 6.5 now, or 6.7. But India is maybe the same or better, 7%. But sometimes when we really count the components in mainland China, we think 6.5% growth rate, 2% is pollution. They pollute, they produce the polluted food, goods. So it should take out 2%. Another 2% is extra capacity. As I mentioned, why they need the supply farm reform. They produce too much steel, too much coal, or too many coal, or too, too many ions, and uh, that's useless. And you can see, say, there are several ghost towns in mainland China. So, for those kind of investment, actually, it's useless. Of course, I don't deny their investment in railway, in high-speed rail, or transportation, or the other good stuff. But, some of their investment, indeed, is useless. So, I'm not that, that uh, perspective about Taiwan's economic future. We are kind of uh, mature. Of course, 2% is not good, because compared to, to Korea, they are about 3%. But I think um, in the future, if our new, go our new government, we have the 5 plus 2 new uh, economic policy, and to want to foster, foster better uh, local local in, in industry or local to make the green green economy or whatever the new uh, economic policy I think that can help Taiwan one percent more then we can reach three percent as Korea yeah. okay. It's my honor to be here, and uh, I, I think I, I have two questions uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, India and China. <laughs> uh, the first, not Taiwan. No, not Taiwan. No, my, my president talked uh, talk a lot of uh, uh, cross, uh, cross trade relationships, and I, 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 want, uh, I was wondering that uh, we know that the BRICS leaders the summit is just finished uh, in, in China. Uh, and I, I want to know, uh, we know uh, China invited uh, Mexico, Thailand, uh, Egypt, and, and five countries to join a meeting. And uh, I, I want to know uh, uh, the, uh, what's uh, uh, your opinions about uh, Brinks Plus. And will India and China strengthen, uh, then, uh, strengthen the, your uh, economic uh, cooperation due, uh, due to Greece, the first question. Uh, the second one is, uh, we know uh, China promoted one bill and 
uh, one of the uh, strategy right now. And I want to know uh, the views of India. Maybe I can answer. Yeah, Mr. Kant, you are the best <laughs> speaker of this subject. You know, on the first question, well, the, you could start with the second answer. No, no. You know, on the first question on the BRICS summit, as you know, it just got over. Uh, Mr. Modi was there. And uh, as for BRICS plus, you know, this is left to host country to decide which country the host country is like. We hosted big summit in Goa last year, and we invited uh, our Bimstek you know, members country. We had uh, an outreach summit with Bimstek countries there. Now this was China's turn to host a shaman, so they decided which countries uh, they would like to host. But uh, at present, uh, there is no consensus in expanding BRICS. So we are staying with the present uh, composition of the present membership of BRICS. Uh, we'll prefer consolidating BRICS as it exists today. And I think it has a come, a, come a long way. Uh, we have some uh, good achievements to our credit. Uh, the most important uh, concrete achievement has been uh, setting up a new development bank at Shanghai, where all five countries are equal stakeholders. This is different from uh, AIIB, where uh, you know, equity is depending on yeah, it's AIIB equity is linked to a certain formula which makes China the largest stakeholder, India the second largest stakeholder. In New Development Bank or BRICS Bank, all five countries hold 20% equity. We have also you know, set up uh, uh, this facility uh, for you know, contingent reserve arrangement, uh, which has been operationalized, uh, which is a useful facility. I think focus is on uh, expanding uh, economic cooperation, uh, commercial links, uh, functional cooperation. This big summit, from India's perspective, uh, one thing which has received a lot of attention in our media is listing of certain terrorist entities uh, in Pakistan. That has received attention, positive attention. We were a little worried about this big summit, before the big summit, uh, because of certain developments which have taken place in the border areas, I'm sure. You are aware of that. Okay. Yeah. Fortunately, that was resolved and this engagement was reached uh, before the big summit, which created a positive climate for big summit. It also got reflected in positive outcomes achieved at big summit. So that's on BRICS. Uh, as for the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, this is one area where uh, India has certain uh, reservations. Uh, Professor Lin referred to uh, you know, Belt and Road Forum, which took place in, uh, in Beijing, which was hosted by President Xi Jinping. India didn't uh, attend uh, uh, the forum uh, because of uh, reservations, partly on account of uh, Belt, and, you know, Belt and Road, especially China Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is uh, projected as flagship component of both land and maritime dimension of Belt and Road Initiative passing through Pakistan occupied Kashmir. So we have a sovereignty related concern there which China has not been able to address. That's one. Secondly, the way Belt and Road Initiative is being developed, uh, we have some reservations which uh, we are discussing the Chinese side. We've also articulated publicly. But in the meantime, uh, India is not in a position to endorse Belt and Road Initiative. Though I must say that uh, AIIB, for instance, which was also originally conceived as part of Belt and Road, at that time it was called One Belt, One Road, because you all. And we did join it because that was developed in one plan to concentration of other partner countries, including India. So we are, as I mentioned earlier, second largest stakeholder in AIIB. So we are open to certain projects and activities which might be taken up with China as long as it's developed in the manner we are comfortable with we are right itself but there are some observations in India. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Is there uh, any uh, infrastructure uh, uh, which is uh, China uh, investment? Uh, we welcome Chinese investment in India. 
and um, in last three years we have seen them, uh, you know, such an uptick in Chinese investment. According to Chinese uh, data, the investment in India is now about five billion dollar. Our data is slightly different because it doesn't also factor in uh, indirect flows through, for instance, Hong Kong. Um, so this is a trend to welcome. We would like Chinese companies to get more involved in economic development in India. We have also developed, you know, this template of what is called closer developmental partnership. This was agreed during President Xi Jinping's visit to India in September 2014. It was developed further when Prime Minister Modi visited China in 2015. I happened to be ambassador at that time in Beijing during all these visits. Essentially, it means that uh, you know, greater economic cooperation between India and China can contribute to both the stories of both countries. So this is something we consider positively. And Prime Minister Modi is also then disposed towards that. Well, I think we have um, President Lee and the delegation and they have to leave at 5 o'clock. Uh, so let me conclude here by saying that uh, Professor Lin made an excellent presentation, uh, full of insights. At the same time, it was both lucid and frank. He acknowledged, you know, a basic uh, predicament uh, which Taiwan has uh, with regard to cross-strait relations. I would say highly divisive issue politically, uh, manifested in the Sun Club movement, but elsewhere also, and how it's passing through a difficult period when there is absence of political consensus between uh, Taiwan and, and mainland China, then so-called 1992 consensus is not being you know, uh, recognized by the present administration in Taiwan. Uh, we understand the, your predicament, the, uh, the internal political discourse within uh, Taiwan as a sister democracy. We can relate to that uh, quite easily. Uh, we also welcome uh, the point you made that uh, as there are the doubts about the excessive dependence on mainland China uh, for Taiwan's own economic development and economic future. There is a greater realization that there is need to diversify economic engagement. And there India fits in well. And this is one aspect we would like you to know. Okay. Pursue more <laughs> energetically. Yeah. So thank you very much for yeah. finding time to come to.